Live from Austin, Texas, it's The Cube. Covering South by Southwest 2017. Brought to you by Intel. Now, here's John Furrier. Okay, we're back live here at the South by Southwest Intel AI Lounge. This is The Cube's exclusive coverage of South by Southwest with Intel. Hashtag Intel AI, where amazing stars with Intel. Our next guest is Dr. Don Nafis, who's with Intel, and you are a senior research scientist. Welcome yes. to The Cube. Thank you. So you've got a panel coming up, but you also have a book, AI for Everything. And looking at a democratization of AI, and we had a quote yesterday that AI is the bulldozer of, for data. What bulldozers were in the, in the real world, is AI will be that bulldozer for data, surfacing new experiences. Right. This is the subject of your book, kind of. What, what's your take on this, and what's your premise? Right, well, um, the book actually takes a step way back. Um, it's actually called Self-Tracking. The panel is AI for everyone, but the book is on self-tracking. And um, it's really about uh, actually, you know, getting some meaning out of data before we ta start talking about bulldozers, right? So right now we've got this situation where, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, AI is going to sort of solve all our problems in health, right? And there's a lot that can actually get accomplished. Whoops. But the fact of the matter is, is that people are still struggling with G's, like what does my Fitbit data actually mean, right? So there's this, there's a real big gap. Um, and I think probably, you know, part of what the industry has to do is not just sort of, you know, build new great technologies, which we've got to do, but um, also start to fill that gap in sort of data education, data literacy, all that sort of stuff. So we're kind of in this first generation of AI data. You mm -hmm. mentioned wearables, Fitbits. Yep. So people are now getting used to this. So mm -hmm. this, it sounds like this integration into lifestyle becomes kind of a dynamic. Yeah. How are people grokking with this? What's your research say about that? Well, right now, um, with wearables, frankly, we're in the you know the classic trough of disillusionment, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, you know, for those of you listening, I don't know if you have sort of wearables in drawers right now, right? But a lot of people do, um, and it turns out that folks tend to use it, um, you know, maybe about three three or four weeks, um, and either they've learned something really interesting and helpful. Um, or they haven't. And so um, there's actually a lot of people who do really interesting stuff to kind of combine it with symptoms tracking, um, location, right, other sorts of things to actually um, really reveal the sorts of triggers for, you know, medical issues that you can't find in a clinical setting, right? It's yeah. all about being out in the real world and figuring out what's going on with you, yeah. right? So then when we start to think about adding more complexity into that, which is the thing that AI is good at, yeah. right? Um, we've got this problem of there's only so many data sets that AI is actually any good at handling, right? Um, and so I think there's going to have to be a moment where sort of, you know, people themselves actually start to say, okay, you know what, this is how I define my problem, right? Yeah. This is what I'm going to choose to keep track of. And some of that's going to be on a sensor yeah. and some of it isn't, right? And sort of really being, you know, intervening a little bit more strongly in what this stuff's actually doing. You mentioned the Fitbit, and you were seeing a lot of disruption in the, in the areas, in innovation and disruption, mm -hmm. same thing. Good and bad, potentially, but <laughs> obviously autonomous vehicles is pretty clear. Everyone knows that Tesla's tracking, and mm -hmm. they're a hot trend. But you mentioned Fitbit, that's a healthcare kind of thing. Mm -hmm. AI might seem to be a perfect fit into healthcare, right. because there's all these alarms going off, and all this data yeah, yeah, lying yeah. around. Yeah, How is, yeah. it, is that a low-hanging fruit for AI? Healthcare. Well, I don't know if there's any such thing as low-hanging fruit <laughs> in this space, um, but certainly if you're talking about like actual human benefit, right, that absolutely comes to the top of the list, yeah. right? And we can see that in both formal healthcare, right, yeah. in clinical settings and sort of imaging for diagnosis. Yeah. Um, again, I think there's, you know, areas to be cautious about, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that, you know, there's also an appropriate human check. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also mechanisms for transparency, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that doctors, when there is a discrepancy between what the doctor believes and what the machine says, you can actually go back and, and figure out what's actually going on. Um, the other thing I'm particularly excited about is, and this is why I'm so interested in democratization, is that health is not just about you know, what goes on in clinical care, right? Um, there are right now, you know, environmental health groups who are looking at a slew of air quality data that they don't know what to do with, right? And yeah. a certain amount of machine assistance to sort of figure out, you know, signatures of sort of point source polluters, for example, is a really great use 
of AI, right? It's not going to make anybody any money anytime soon, but that's the sorts of, you know, that's the kind of society that we want to live there in, right? There is a social good angle for sure, but Absolutely. I'd like to get your thoughts because you mentioned democratization mm -hmm. and it's kind of a nuance depending upon what, what, what you're looking at. Yep. Democratization with news and media is what you saw with social media, now you got healthcare. So how do you define democratization in your context that you're excited about? Right. Is that more of um, freedom of information and data? Is it getting around gatekeepers and siloed stacks? I mean, how do you mm -hmm. look at democratization? All of the above. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd say there, you know, there are two real elements to that. Um, the first is um, making sure that you know people who are going to use this for more than just business um, have the ability to actually do it, right, mm -hmm. and have access to the right sorts of infrastructures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to really, you know, do whether it's the environmental health case or, you know, there are actually artists now who use natural language processing um, to create artwork. And, you know, people ask them, why aren't you using deep learning? It's like, well, there's a, there's a real access issue, frankly. Yeah. Um, it's also on the side of, um, you know, if you're not the person who's going to be directly using data, um, a, a kind of a sense of, you know, there are bigger... Democratization to me means being able to ask questions of how the stuff's actually behaving, right? So that yeah. means building in um, mechanisms for transparency, um, building in mechanisms to allow journalists to do the, do the work that they do. Um, sharing, uh, potentially. I'm sorry? And sharing as well, more right, data. Right, 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 absolutely. I mean, frankly, we still have a problem right now in the wearable space of people even getting access to their own data, right? There are, there's a, a guy I work with named Hugo Campos who has a, um, an arterial defibrillator, and he's still fighting to get access to the very data that's coming out of his heart. Right? <laughs> so is it on an SSD? I mean, is it in the cloud? I mean, it's, it is, where is it? It, it, so? isn't, it is in the cloud. It's going back to the manufacturer, <laughs> and there are very robust conversations about where it should be. That's super exciting. This is, so this brings up the whole thing that we've been talking about yesterday, we've had a mini segments on theCUBE, is that there are all these new societal use cases that uh -huh. are just springing up that we've never seen before. Right. Um, Self-driving cars with transportation, right. healthcare, access to data, all these things. What are some of the things that, that you see emerging on that tools or approaches that could help uh, either scientists or practitioners or citizens right. deal with this new pro critical problem solving that needs to apply technology to because you know, whether right. it's, I mean, I was talking just last week at Stanford with folks that are looking at gender bias and algorithms. Right, I mean, uh -huh. Something I would never would have thought of, that's like an outlier, like, oh, hey, Oh no, what? it's not. <laughs> no, but it's one yeah. of those things where, okay, let's put that on the table. There's yeah, all yeah, this yeah. new stuff coming on the table. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What, what do you see? So how, there, how do we solve that with approaches? Yeah, there, there are a couple of mechanisms, and I would encourage, encourage listeners and, and folks in the audience um, to have a look at a really great report that just came out um, from the Obama administration and New York NYU School of Law. Um, it's called AI Now, and they actually propose um, a, a, a couple of pathways, right, to sort of making sure we get this right. So, you know, a couple of things. Um, you know, one is frankly making sure that women and people of color are in the room when the stuff's getting built, yeah. right? That helps. Um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, making sure that, you know, things will go awry. Like, it just will. We can't predict yeah. how these things are going to work. Um, and catching it after the fact and building in mechanisms to be able to do that um, really matters. There was a great um, effort by ProPublica um, to look at a system that was predicting um, criminal recidivism, right? Mm -hmm. And what they did yeah. was they said, look, you know, it is true that um, uh, the thing has the same failure rate for both blacks and whites, um, but some hefty data journalism and data scraping and all the rest of it actually revealed that um, it was producing false positives for blacks and false negatives for whites, meaning that black people were predicted to yeah. create more crime than white people, right? So, you know, we can catch that, right? Yeah. And, and, and when we build in more systems of people who the had the skills to do it, then, you know, we can build stuff that we can live with. This is exactly to your point of democratization, I think, that right. fascinates me, that I get excited about. And it's almost intoxicating if you think about it technically and also, you know, societal. That there's all these new things that are emerging and the community has to work together because it's one of those things where there's no, there's may or may be a board of governance out there. I mean, who is the board of governance for this stuff? Exactly. It really has to be community driven. Yeah. And, and yeah. Is, is NYU's got one. Any other examples of yeah. communities that are, are are out there that people can participate in or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I think that you know there. 
certainly collaborating on projects that you actually care about and sort of asking good questions about is this appropriate for AI or not, right, is a great place to start and reaching out with yeah. people to people who have those technical skills. Um, there are also um, uh, the Engineering Professional Association actually just came out a couple months ago with a set of guidelines for developers yeah. um, to be able to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know the thing, the kinds of things you have to think about if you're going to build an ethical AI system. So they came out with some very high-level principles. Yeah. Um, operationalizing those principles is going to be a real tough job, and we're all going to have to pitch in. And I'm certainly involved in that. Um, but yeah, there are actually systems of governance that are cohering, but it's early days. It's a great, great way to get involved. So I got to ask you the personal question: uh -huh. In your uh, efforts with the research and the book and all uh -huh. your travels, yep. what's the, some of the most amazing things that you've seen? with AI that are out there that people may know about or may not know about that they should know about? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm going to reserve judgment. I don't know yet. I think we're too early on the curve to be yeah. able to talk about, you know, sort of the, the magic of it. What I can say is that there is real power when um, ordinary people who have no coding skills whatsoever and frankly don't even know what the heck machine learning is, um, get their heads around data that is collected about them mm -hmm. personally, right? Yeah. That opens up, you can teach five-year-olds statistical concepts that are learned in college with a wearable because the data applies to them. Yeah. So they know how it's been collected. It's personal. Yeah, they know they know what it is already. You don't have to tell them what an outlier effect is because they know because they were that outlier. You know what I mean? They're right? they're immersed in the data. Absolutely, and, and that I think that's where the real yeah. social change is going to come. I love from. immersion is a great way to teach kids, and and mm -hmm. but the data is key. So I got to ask you the big pillars of change going on. And at Mobile World Congress, I saw uh, you Intel in particular talking about um, autonomous vehicles heavily. Uh -huh. Smart cities, right. media entertainment, right. and um, a smart home. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a peg, a, a comparable of how big this shift will be vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, the 60s revolution when chips started coming out, the PC revolution and server revolution, and now we're kind of in this yeah. new wave. Mm -hmm. How big is it? I mean, in order of magnitude, is it super huge? All of the other shifts combined? Uh, are we going to see radical know. configuration you know, changes? And You know, I'm an anthropologist, right? <laughs> so, you know, everything changes and nothing changes at the same time, right? We're still going to wake up, we're still going to put on our shoes in the morning, right? We're still going to have a lot of the same values and social structures and all the rest of it that yeah. we've always had, right? Um, so I don't think in terms of, plonk, here's a bunch of technology, now now that's a revolution, right? There's like a dialogue, right? Yeah. And, and we are just at the very, very baby steps of having that dialogue. Um, but when we do, right, um, the, the, you know, people in my field call it domestication, right? Yeah. These things become tame, they become part of our lives, we shape them and they shape us. And that's, that's not radical change, right? That's yeah. the change we always have. That's evolution. So I got to ask you a question because I have four kids and I have this conversation with my wife and friends all the time because we have kids, digital natives are growing up. Yep. And, we, and we see a lot of also workplace um, domestication, uh -huh. people kind of getting domesticated with the new technologies. What's your advice for whether it's parents uh, to their kids, kids yep. to growing up in this world, yep. whether it's education, how should people approach the technology that's coming at them so heavily right. in an age of social media where all the voices are equal right now, yet more right. filters are coming out, so uh, it's pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's an occasion where people have to think a lot more deliberately than they ever have about you know, the sources of information that they want exposure to, right? The, the, the kinds of um, interactions and mechanisms that actually do and don't matter. Um, and thinking very clearly about what's noise and what's not is a fine thing to do, right? <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, probably the filtering mechanisms has to get a bit, a bit stronger. Um, I would say too, there's a whole set of practices, you know, there are ways that you can scrutinize new devices for, you know, where the data goes, right? Um, and often, um, you know, kind of the higher bar companies will give you access back, right? Um, so if you can't get your data out again, I would start asking questions. Right? All right, final two questions for you. What's your experience is like so far at South by Southwest? Yep. 
And where is the world going to take you next in terms of your research and your focus? Right. Well, um, I, this is my second year at South by Southwest. Um, it's hugely fun. I am so pleased to see just a rip-roaring crowd here at the Intel facility, which is just amazing. I think this is our first time as Intel proper. Um, Having a really good time. Um, the the self-tracking book is in the bookshelf um, uh, over in the convention center if you're interested. And what's next is we are going to get real um, about how to make how to make these ethical principles actually work as, at an engineering yeah. level. Yeah, computer science meets social science mm -hmm. happening right now. Absolutely. Intel powering amazing here at South by Southwest. I'm John Furrier. You're watching the Cube. We got a great set of people here on theCUBE, also great AI lounge experience, great demos, great technologists, all about AI for social change. I'm with Dr. Don Napis with Intel. We'll be right back with more coverage after this short break.